Welcome, folks, to Horror After Midnight. I am your host, Slinky, and joined by my co-host. Casey. <laughs> there we go. And uh, tonight we have an awesome guest. We have a very cool guest. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself to the world, sir, and we'll kick this bitch right off. <laughs> Hello, I'm Warren Lepre. I am an actor out of the Philadelphia area, also a film director. I also run two film festivals out of Philadelphia, Freedom Shorts and Liberty Massacre. Uh, I've been in... Uh, about 100 films, independent film wise, and my two my my crowning jewels at uh, my two films, Pennsylvania Hardcore, where I covered um, 30 years of the Pennsylvania Hardcore scene from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, everywhere in between. I did about 200 interviews for that. Currently, right now, you can watch that for free on Tubi, and uh, my my gem that just came out, The Dark Military, which you can watch for free on Amazon and Tubi. And uh, that's been, that's my horror franchise. I'm starting off there with a, making a trilogy here, introducing new horror movie icons. Had about 70 actors in it. We've reviewed over 40 times. It's doing pretty good. And I also have a small raw part in the movie Terrifier, as well as helping out with a few locations. What, dude? You're a beast. Like, yeah. You are a beast, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy, man. You are all over the place. Well, that, I, when you're independent, you have to be. You have to have your hand in many things, and I just all the pies. You're just, yeah, you're yeah. just making all these networks, hoping something grabs you. You know, so, someone someone pulls you into uh, what you want to do. If you just yeah. if you just do one thing and just be like, "This is what I got," and sit back. I mean, they don't, you don't know if you're getting real. Then, guys, you don't. You have to just keep. You got to keep going. You got to yeah, do right. whatever you could. You got to do shows like this. You know, you got you got to build your audience. Well, actually, uh, a good segue into that. Um, I, usually, we ask this, you know, ask this question at the end of the thing. But since you just, you know, touched on it, what what is it you can? What's the best advice you could give someone who's just getting into the indie scene, like who's trying to break in, you know? First, and it's the first thing is with, with that. I can tell you where you could what, what what to do, but it's it's a little bit of a process of elimination. See, when I got involved with the business in two thousand ten. I went to acting school at Walnut Street Theater by just being in a film called um, Jeff Jeff Stewart did a zombie movie called The Reunion. It never came out. It was up in Trenton. But I went to that movie set, basically no pay, but they had this awesome setup for food and they had a keg of beer and they had about 30 of us getting into zombie makeup. And all I was doing in the meantime, I mean, it's my first time there. I'm just watching the movie set and I mm -hmm. fell in love. So all our scene is at the end of the movie is we break into this garage and walk towards the camera, and then you don't know if the main actor dies or not. But okay. I, I got such chills by doing just that little thing that I fell in love with acting, and I went to Walnut Street Theater. And then, man, guys, I didn't know what to do for Adam. Like I was going to Craigslist. I was just looking. I was asking anybody, like, where do I, where's the websites, you know? So you kind of got to, like – fish around it's great if you know somebody because you can at least get some advice but i was doing every film i could do and mm. i didn't know if it was good or bad because i'm new i just got to put trust in the people so yeah. I, I started moving along which is probably only about four months later there was another movie i was filmed in a horror movie called cross Bear that was being filmed in philly that's a full feature that was a it was a small budget but they had they had it all they had the lighting the audio they had it down they said they needed help with PAs. That's my advice for everybody. Work yep. a full feature movie set. Walk in. Don't tell them that you know more than you know. Just be like, I'm new. I'm here to help yeah. where I can. And, you know, you, you, you kind of just do what they tell you to do. And, yeah. and if anybody's been on a movie set, you realize there's a lot of downtime. And that's where you can kind of ask questions and, and, and kind of learn and get your hands on. Yeah. You got to get in there. And when I got out of there, I thought I was uh, very well tuned after that. But at the same time, I'm going right back. I'm still doing any film I can do. So I'm going right back to other films. It's just some guy walking around with a camera. And I'm like, I just came from all this high production value. I'm like, you're new, man. Just shut up. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just roll out. with it, man. Just roll with it, you know? Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. that's another thing, too. You don't, you don't know who's gonna, who is who. You don't want to get a bad reputation, but at the same time, yeah, there's that balance, guys. And when you're in Philadelphia too, especially, like everyone's just trying to one up each other. So 
Like yeah. there was a lot of comments and stuff I'd say that I like I had to take it on the chin. I'm like, don't say nothing. I don't know if that person's someone huge, like like you know, they know someone that knows somebody. Just you're new. You know, just kind of stay in the back and watch. But you just build from there and little by little, like those people start fading. Then before you know it, like you're helping the newer people and you're like, I don't know if I should be the one doing this, but like you, you just start going through the process of elimination. Yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds like you just, it's like, you know, a lot of other industries, you got to pay your dues, man. You got to yep. go in and just roast your bones. So no, that's great. That's great. And you sound very yeah. humble. So yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> I grew up all <laughs> watching Ric Flair, Prince, and Jerry Lee Lewis and David Lee Roth. Okay. So I have that side of me, but <laughs> yeah, time, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> that time, you, you got to know. You got you got to contain that stuff, and yeah, absolutely, absolutely. One of the things, also, uh, I mean, no one likes hearing stuff like this. But when I was started uh, making my own films, because I was watching everyone else just walk around with a camera, no lighting, no audio, and it and it was like everyone thought they were a king when they released these films, and they would screen them at a coffee shop, and I'm like, look at these thirty people came out. These thirty people think they're great, but but they're so all it is is they're friends and family. And so yeah. I, it doesn't seem too hard. I can, I'm going to come a film director. And you, you turn into this, I call it like the Philly virus, particularly Philly. It's like everybody gets caught in this. Like an yep. actor just came in and did two two parts in a film and says, hey, that's not hard. You know, I just did the same thing. that Now they're doing it. You have to be able to take criticism. And it turned out I had some people in the industry in the West Coast, and I sent them links to my film. And they roasted and laughed at me so hard. And was like, dude, these are absolute garbage. Who is teaching you this stuff? And I'm like, oh, but what did this person, like, who's this person? Google them right now. Like, nothing comes up. But like, listen to us. All right. We don't want to break your spirits, but we got to help guide you better. So that's when you start learning. Like, you can't do a film without lighting and audio. Then yeah. first time you, it's like you never heard the word, you know, storyboard. And script supervisor and all this stuff they're like mm -hmm. you know you, you get fine well tuned and then like you explain that to the people you're with and they're like what are you talking about you don't need to do all that like where are you going you know you know what yeah. are you yeah. together yeah. and you know before you know it you kind of kind of cut these people out and people see you working hard you get pulled into bigger projects i always yeah. love when i get pulled up to a bigger project with people that are better than me I love that because now I'm back in line learning and I'm getting better. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. absolutely. You see, you know? you're always learning, man. That's the thing. You're always learning. You're always um, learning. Like Randy Couture said, and you are, <laughs> you're only as tough as who you train with. You know, if you, yes. if you see pop yes. them and you're the toughest guy in the room, you got to go train with a new camp. You need yeah. to be back in the line, you know? Yeah, yeah, because your, your just, film's like shot really well. Like it looks like a, like a real movie. It don't play out like an indie and it's like really low, low budget film. It looks like a you know a good movie. And thank you for that. And, and that took uh, a good five years to build that budget um, to uh, put, get a network like that. And and I mean, we lit up the woods with like we, we had sky lifts in the woods, shining lights down. That's how we did it. You know. Yeah. And I mean, you gotta you gotta have the right team. I had about a hundred people between on that first day of the shoot between the actors and the crew. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, they, we did the Tampa Bay. It was it was Tampa Bay horror independent horror film festival a couple of years ago, and um, like you said before, the, some of the movie snobs they nicknamed them backyard movies. Uh -huh. Where like there was no lighting, there was like really you know minimal production, yeah. and uh, so yeah, just just that that um, difference between some of the other films that you know they had like a cinematographer or whichever or even. Something like you said, as basic as lighting would just, it adds so much, you know, and I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't think an actor could shine without lighting and audio. I just think it, everybody looks generic. Well, they have to look kind of, you know, like iconic. Go ahead, brother. Run with it, buddy. You know? Um, ahead, yeah. I saw you were like a, a pro wrestler, an MMA fighter. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. So I, I, I was involved with both of them. So when I was younger, I didn't want to be in film. I wanted to either play for the Philadelphia Phillies. Uh, that didn't work out. <laughs> or I wanted to be a professional wrestler. And that's, I actually ended up doing that. Uh, I was more of a wrestling manager, but I've been involved with about 54 wrestling matches. My era for wrestling was 1997 to two, 2004. And what I was doing was 
I lived in Scranton area and in 2000, uh, yeah, sorry, 1996, ECW finally came up uh, to Scranton and I was there like five hours early and I'm like walking in the building while they're setting up chairs and I'm like, just start setting up chairs. Like I'm just trying to, I'm like, I'm like breaking in the building technically because I just want to be around the business. Like I want a job. Finally, I got out. They're like, what are you doing here, kid? They're like, get out in the back. But no, they kept escorting me out. So they kept kind of coming around uh, about five, five or six times. And I was like that cat you fed in the back porch. You fed it once and you could kick, keep kicking it in the face. It's not going to go anywhere. That's what I was doing every show. <laughs> so little by little, like, hey, they might need a hand with something. They were like, you know, let that nutty kid in for five minutes and have him lift everything heavy and then send them back out. I was doing all this sucker work, guys. I mean, totally for free. Then I started coming to the ECW arena and uh, where I started dressing up as Sabu. If anyone ever remembered a guy who dressed up as Sabu about three or four years at the arena, that is me. When Bigelow put uh, Taz through the ring, the first guy that stood up was me. But yeah, I mean, those, that, those were great times. It was great being a fan. But eventually I ran into two guys that actually uh, helped with promoting. Uh, sorry, a couple that actually uh, helped with promoting. I met them at the November to Remember trip, uh, 1997. And by the time we got off the bus ride, they said, you seem very enthusiastic. Would they, they go, would you have be willing to come here and help us promote? But you're going to do exactly what we say. And I was like, yes. And that's how I came down here in 1999. So I was doing a lot of behind the scenes stuff. I never, ever wrestled for ECW. That never, never happened. I did start working the independence. I looked at, because I had a connection to ECW, hopefully I would have gotten my shot at some point. Maybe the door would have opened, and then 2001 comes, and WCW folds, and ECW folds, and that just never happened. So I stuck around the independent scene for a few years before basically taking a break. I kind of knew I wasn't coming back. I just wasn't, my heart wasn't into it anymore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and that's, and I always was in martial arts the entire time. And I started getting the, the MMA bug, and I did fight. Uh, but that was more what they call the smoker amateur level. I just never made it up to the pro before my body started kind of letting me know. You might want to you might want to yeah. stick with art, <laughs> not pushing yourself so hard in MMA. Even if I, oh, that if I even broke through and got a professional fight, the amount of damage I may have put to my body, win or yeah. Uh, it was smart, and that's when the I actually I just went to be an extra in that movie up in Trenton, and and changed my life. I wasn't looking to be an actor, so I mean, it's crazy how I transitioned three different times, and here I am, you know, yeah. ten years later, still doing the film stuff. So, yeah, that's awesome, man. Because yeah, it's, I have a similar story. Uh, a few months back, I went up to um, Ohio to film with uh, the guys from uh, Nevermore Productions, uh, Screen Team releasing. Yeah, okay, I, I, it puts my film out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. Went up there and awesome. filmed a little bit in the uh, the barn too as an extra and a zombie as a zombie. It's kind of cool now to see how movies are made because like we were there ten hours or so for maybe like, like a four minute scene. It's really cool to see that stuff. Yeah, I know. Isn't it amazing? Like when it's done, you're like, we did all this just for that little, you know, yeah. <laughs> that little set. <laughs> yeah. I still that part will never get old to me. I'm just I, sometimes like you're you're watching somebody just transition from a hallway into a room. And it's an entire day. When you watch it, it's like four and a half seconds. You're like, mother, like the amount of stress it took to do that because of the difficulties. But yeah. So, but yeah, Justin's one of the hardest working guys. Uh, he really is. Yeah. So, you know, I saw the barn. I like the barn. Uh, pumped to see the second one. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to see that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you wrote, directed, and acted in the dark military. <laughs> Can you uh, tell us a little bit about like your character in the film? Okay, so it, it was, but my character's name is Barabbas, and he is the leader of the dark military. Uh, it was it was kind of weird how it, this, the dark military came together. I kept saying, I know I have enough of a network after five years to make a feature. Um, I want to see about getting some money together and taking a shot. And I was like, I want to make a horror movie. I want to be the dude. But I was like, I don't want to be alone. And I kept seeing a vision. I just saw him like with shadow. I just saw him with a few shadows. 
And I'm like, I want a team. I was like, we haven't had a real a team besides like the Devils rejects. I was like, I want to make a bigger team. It's like we could use something like this. And it, little by little, I just started picturing, you know, five, five to eight people. And I came up with the concept and it took me nine months. I rewrote that script 19 times before I got oh, it right. Wow. Because I, again, I'm not a script writer. So everyone's just like, this isn't a proper format. You said this six different ways on one page. Why don't you just say it once and keep moving? Like, I, you know, sorry, man. Like, you're just trying to, you yeah. know, what you're doing. Like, you're, you're brand new, you know? So process of elimination where you get that script down. I also always would advise people, if you got to write a script, you want to do a movie, if you want to have, you, you need to write it around your network. Meaning, yes. that's yes. your does your parents own a business? Take stock of what you have. Exactly. Yeah, don't say like we want to blow New York City up. Like, yo, dude, you're you're good. you're not filming in New York and you're independent. Yeah, yeah. Like, like I got access to a gas truck. What can I? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Is, your, is your parents mm -hmm. all with you know? Do they have access to fire trucks? Exactly. Like all that. You know, like you just yeah. write. They're not telling you don't go after that film. Just don't go after it first. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. right around what you know. So, yeah, so I just, I, I just figured what my character is like, there's Jezebel, there's Barabbas, there's Judas, there's Cain, there's Delilah. I picked all those names out of the Bible, you know, and it's like, you know, they're, they're coming out of the dark web. That's where these, are, these, get, these people are coming from. That's like a scary thing, what happens in the dark web. You find out there's a, you know, there's a general who's funding all this. But it's like at the same end, I was like, I didn't want any – slander towards god or jesus in any way the names are never mentioned in the movie because i just think that's so typical <laughs> there's a lot of yeah. things in the whole movie yeah. i can't say it's typical i'm like no i was just like i want these guys to be a mystery they are hired to do a job to upgrade halloween you know then that's that's the idea of the dark military with the whole trilogy and how did you come up with the idea for that though like what was it that you know you know what uh, when i told inspired you, I you to do it I said, besides seeing that vision with the team, uh, I live alone, and then I also work a real world job at the gas company where I work alone a lot. So you're just sitting there all day, and I'm yeah, seeing gears are just spinning, man. Yeah, yeah, little by little, I started uh, putting things together, and I always said my first feature, I wouldn't have like more than twelve to fifteen people in it because I was like. Roll lightly, man. Like, just have a small cast do something yeah, simple yeah. before you know it. <laughs> I was like, wow, I'm totally hypocritical, and I'm going to go way bigger, and I had all those people on set and everything. Because so I looked at – the first thing I looked at is, like, I have five, five members of the dark military, the main members anyway. They can't kill just one pe one person. It's like, if I'm going to build these guys up that, like, you know, who they are, they got to kill multiple. I got to have multiple good guys. So now that thing, that 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 part went right through the roof, and I wanted people to be able to relate to the you know the like all the prey, you know, and you got your jocks, you got your punks, you got you know you got you got a little of this one and that one. I'm trying to throw out people that people can relate to, you know, to get attached to. And I didn't want anybody in the film without a name. I've always hated that horror movies like at Friday the Thirteenth. Jason just walks into the woods, sees a couple for 45 seconds. He don't even get their names. He just kills them. I'm like, no, I want, I want, I want these people to talk even just for a little bit you know and, and get and get their names up so yeah that was that was important to me cool. yeah yeah you gotta have some uh character building and stuff just so you care about who's dying yeah we don't have that it, <laughs> yeah. it goes bad yeah. not char not char nah you know yeah, yeah. And, and it's why you see at the very beginning i'm trying not to over spoil the movie or anything but like you see the dark military for the first minute of the film then you don't see him for about 27 minutes because you're learning all the characters yeah, good guys like they step aside, you know, when they come back, changes everything up, but yeah, you know, so you got to give time for those characters to develop, and you got to have the audience like hopefully caring about those characters, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, it was pretty cool to see it as like a like a web show. Like, uh, what made you or what made you want to decide to do like a web show for the movie? Well, I kind of looked at I looked at the the hunting things actually obviously been done over and over again, but I wanted to put my spin. So this is where the dark web came in, and um, you know that was being broadcast live on the internet. And Halloween that kind of took over everything that everybody in the world could watch. Like Halloween literally shut down because everyone was like, "Yo, you see what the hell's going on here?" You know, we can't get this link down. You know, so 
and the fact, simple fact that there's a general funding all this and you only have so much time to stop them and they already tell you they're coming back next Halloween. You know, I, I just I, I just thought that was a cool spin anyway, you know, so that's what that's what I went for. And I ran with it. That's awesome. That's yeah, awesome. it came out really well. I really, I really enjoyed it. And it was very like a very intense movie. Uh, is there any like behind the scenes like stories you like to share that, like you really like enjoyed? Uh, there's a few. All right. So, uh, there's definitely some behind the scene footage on the DVD, everyone, or Blu-ray, everyone should check out. You could also, if you put in YouTube, a dark military, everyone can watch behind the scenes. I, I did put some of the, some of it up, but one of the Ooh. funniest things I have to say, like it, there, there was a few like great moments with, with that film. Um, first off the fuse network came one night during the week. We actually, uh, one of our cast members was involved with a rea reality show. His name was Rogelio. And he hit me up, and it was like almost like a dance show. And uh, he, he and uh, what, what they were doing is going around to the main five characters, and they would follow them, and you get to know their life. And when they found out that he was going to be in a movie, he hits me up, and he's like all real, like kind of low tone. He's like, "Yeah, uh, the Fuse Network and that show." I'm like, "Yeah." They're like, "They want to know if they could come to the movie set." And like, I I don't want to be a problem. I don't I don't think you're going to want. And I'm like, "Cut him off." Like, just tell me that network wants to come to my movie set and we'd be on the, the fuse network. Yes. Tell them to come immediately. They can do whatever they want. So yeah. <laughs> yeah so about 13 more people came on that night and you know, they basically stayed out of their way. You know, it all worked out with our cameraman. Obviously they weren't going to be on our shots and everything, but you know, they're actually filming him off the side. They're filming me talk to him and everything. And it's like, yo, we're not here. And they, and they did a cool show. So if you put in the dark military fuse TV, you you can watch that whole episode. And it's, uh, it was just really cool. Cause when we were wrapped, you know, months later, here's that episode. We're like, Holy crap. Like who, who the, is, I call that this, the ball bounced my way for, for that. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty yeah. Cool. So that was, that was a cool moment. Um, on the movie set where we did, where the hunt happened was private land up in Franklinville at mm -hmm. our, our producer's house. And they just had a litter of kittens. So, and then people uh, brought their dogs and they it all worked. It just meshed perfectly. So in between the shoot, <laughs> you had the cats and, and dogs to play with. It was like, it was such an upbeat set. It really was. That's cool. Yeah. 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 Cool. Like, yeah. Boosted morale and everything. That's it awesome. That's it, awesome. Really, it was cool. And we had, we had, mm. we had trailers, we had golf carts to like take people like to, to and from because we were going, you know, a little bit of a journey into the woods and stuff. It was, it was, it was cool. I mean, it was. For my cool. first film, yeah. like, you know, I had to do that when I was done, man. It was crazy. <laughs> like, every day I was showing up on set because predominantly it was like 4.30 to 4.30, like, like because we shot, yeah. uh, you know, we had to wait till nightfall, which was around 6 o'clock then. We shot the 4.30 in the morning. I kept pulling up every time and be like, man, this is a well-run set. I'm like, whoever the hell, oh, wait, I'm running this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> That's <laughs> awesome. I had to like shake my head a few times, like I'm in charge of this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See, that's great though. That's great, man. You know, and plus you're setting an example. You know, so right yeah, on, right on. It's very good. You got to keep your your cast in good spirits and stuff. Like um, one of the cool things I like to say, I spent about twenty five hundred dollars on food for 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 about ten ten days of the shoot and. Yeah. And I mean, it was layouts like like the four by eight tables, two in a row. Like, but I mean, it was had everything for every type of food that you want. Diet restriction, we had it all down. And I remember that you know, was awesome. a normal that was awesome. movie set. I would see the director. He goes in and gets his food first, and everybody kind of caters to that that person. I didn't. I sat in the front of the table, watched everybody pass, and I just I basically said thank you every single night for what they were doing and I got my food last out of respect for them. Wow. Yeah, wow. For their food. Like, yeah. I, I did the opposite. You know? That's, that's yeah. awesome, man. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, oh, yeah, for real. Say, speaking, of food, <laughs> speaking of food, speaking of food, the cook on the, uh, the cook in the movie, how was it working with him? Because he was a great actor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's a, he's a great guy. He's, he's a guy that's been around Philadelphia a long time. It was kind of crazy. I literally wrote that, that character for him. I pictured mm -hmm. nobody else saying that. And I've said this to him before, like we always laugh. I'm like, if he was to tell me no, 
I would have killed him. I was like, yo, I got this role for you. It's the cook. I was like, dude, you have to play this. And I had no auditions for this thing. Uh, I literally drafted everybody. Like literally when I was writing, I'm like, this person's going to play this. So I just called them. Like literally everybody said yes, except for like three people. It just didn't pan out. But I drafted. I didn't like. And one of the things, uh, I don't know really anybody else who does this, but I think it's very important when you, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of directors will cast, will just have an open casting call because they're looking for what they believe is the best. Understand, here's my problem with that, with a film like mine that shot for 10 straight days and we have a limited amount of money. 70 actors, they're not all on camera at once. Mm. We're, I'm out in the woods. How do I know a mile that way those people are going to bond off camera? You know, yeah. is yeah. someone too political? Is someone too religious? Is there divas in there? Is there guys in there that can't stop chasing the girls around? I literally yeah. also cast yeah. around that of people like the like Team Dean, Team Teddy, the punk rockers. Like, I looked at, they're going to most likely bond off camera too. Mm-hmm. Are they yeah. going to be all right? Yeah, you, you, I know you both have friends that you, you cherish, but you probably also have certain ones that you're like, I can never put these two in a room together because yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> that's, you have to make sure that chemistry is there yeah, exactly yeah, absolutely. that's absolutely. another reason i drafted i had a lot of people hit me up to like dude you didn't call me like i didn't know there was an you know you, i didn't see anything for auditions i'm like you're right uh, i didn't it's, this is what i felt was best for my first film you know yeah. so it's something to think about folks if you're ever when when that part comes because you could you could see someone could read you read for you I could have people come in read even better for the roles that I cast. How do I know? I don't know these people. I also know a lot of actors I've worked with that have showed up in other people's sets where I'm just an actor and they're like, dude, I didn't even read the script. And I'm like, mental note, never bring this person in because they're showing they're unprepared. Yeah. You yeah, know, that's like, right. I could still be friends with them, but I'm never going to hire them. <laughs> I think, <laughs> you know? I don't know. I think that's smart. I mean, it, it's, probably a little more tougher but um i, I can see that man because you write sir sometimes you know what like kevin smith that's that's jay like he wrote that character as yeah. you know what i mean so yeah no absolutely absolutely yeah and the cook the cook was such an important character to me because while the dark military guys like i know like some of my dialogue people laughed at because he, he he's intentionally he's being mean my character was being mean but he's saying <laughs> funny stuff you know he's just the way he's, he's delivering it's funny I said, yeah. I need a character like the cook to actually be funny because how many horror movies have we watched where, you know, you got that eerie music and the trailer and all that, and it's really trying to sell. This is going to scare the crap out of you when you watch it. You're like, that really wasn't scary. So I just look at, like, put some humor in it. You know, mm-hmm. like, like, like l- lighten the mood a little bit and, and, and the parts that you want scary, try to make it the best they could. And the audience is going either going to roll with it or they're not. But yeah. I still think if you deliver a good product, you know, mm-hmm. one, I, I, I always hate when I hear like, oh, it's going to be the scariest movie you've ever seen. I don't know, guys. I don't really get scared over horror movies. I don't know about you two at all. I'm just looking for a good story with good production value. That's really all I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're yeah. looking for a fun time, you know what I mean? Exactly. And you want to be entertained. Plus, yeah, plus horror and comedy, they, they, they go, if if done right, they go well, so together. Or, mm-hmm. oh, I said that backwards, you know, they <laughs> lend the, yeah, you guys. Yeah, you guys know what you're talking about, but yeah, so that's 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 where the cook came in. You know, he was, he, that's he was awesome. trying to constantly feed that, you know. Well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was great, like, comic relief for the movie. <laughs> so good of an actor. Uh, yeah. I was ask you, with uh, with all the beautiful women in this movie all working together, how did that play out? Because <laughs> it's <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome, Damn it, Chris. That's too funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have to give a little bit kudos because I always talk to my producer about none of our girls looked like the next one. Like they all looked exotically like different and stuff. So I was like, uh, it's another reason that I I picked who I picked as much as I I like them all as, as people. But there was no problem. Honestly, uh, you never know what girls because girls are always the wild card. But uh, <laughs> like, she 
Shannon Sexton, who played Delilah, the you know the, the tougher one with the muscles. Uh, her and Gina Marie Shaw, who plays Jezebel, the one everybody's always asking me, where where is she? <laughs> Can I meet her? Uh, they never met before, and it was crazy the chemistry they have. But um, they're they're they worked great together. I mean, great. <laughs> off camera and everything, like they were attached to the hip, you know. So that 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 was really awesome. Yeah, that's awesome to hear because usually when you get that many women together, there's usually some type of issue. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Well, one of the coolest things about it, well, like what, what I was doing is the first day when we got there, there was like 100 people on there between both shoots on that first day. There was like 100 people. And all I'm thinking is like every day, like four people die. And the set's just going to get smaller and smaller. So you're <laughs> trying to get through it. Little by little, you're like, that person going a little haywire. Let's speed this scene up because we got to get the night. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I, honestly, by the end of the movie, because we literally shot it in order. Uh, towards mm, okay. the end, you, you didn't want the party to, to the end. You didn't want the party to end. Like you know, yeah. that last day on set, there was only about twenty people. You're like, wow, this feels weird. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, oh, it's almost over, but. Uh, it's very hard to shoot in order. Um, I realize that's definitely not a Hollywood thing. Uh, that doesn't really happen. I just happen to have the resources and had it arranged. I wanted to shoot in order so the actors could build up their characters going forward. Because if you shoot out of order, you, the more you shoot in order, the more you're just going to build momentum. Yeah. You know, yeah. Towards the end. And that, that's what I wanted. Uh, so whenever possible, I will do that. Uh, I can't tell you if whatever I do next, I'm going to have access to do that that way, though. You know? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense, man. So, yeah. It was really cool to um, see uh, Alex Vincent, uh, a.k.a. Andy Barkley from Child's Play in this film. <laughs> how was how was it working with him? That was great. I got him at the Days of the Dead convention in Atlanta. Uh, Alex, Alex, I've known probably about 15 years. He was all, I met him mostly through Monster Mania because he was kind of like a staple there for a little while. And uh, I was reaching out because I want the callers of the family calling up and saying, you know, my son, my child, whatever is on this broadcast. What are you doing to get off? That, that was where I got my cameos, where I got like him, Sharon Lentz from Dark Shadows and uh, the Blue Meanie from ECW. And I had more lined up. It just didn't work out, you know? So, but, uh, he was great. You know, I caught him down there and, uh, you know, he did a great job. He was another guy that he, I call him like a script absorber. Like he just, <laughs> he just beat something a couple of times. He's got it down. I'm like, I can't do that. I'm like, I hate wow. <laughs> they <bring it> up <laughs> twice And then like, it's, they, they hit it out of the ballpark. I'm jealous of that shit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've always, always enjoyed all his work. He's a great actor. Yeah. Um, I know a little bit about the stripper. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what happened and like the journey getting back onto like the streaming platform? Okay, so the distributor nightmare that left me and about one thousand filmmakers uh, out in the cold. I am lucky enough to say I'm fully, you know, I'm fully detached to them. I got the rights to my film back right now. Again, you can watch it on Tubi. You can watch it on Amazon, Roku. Uh, we just got on something called Able TV yesterday. Uh, it's kind of a newer network. But what happened with distributor? So basically, here's how it all works, folks. When you get done with a film, you you want to go for film distribution. Here's your problem. But some this this, this is the nightmare where people don't want to hear this. Okay, no one's going to give you money for your film anymore. Okay, guys. So if you put 100k in your film, you're not getting one dime back up front. Uh, the, you, I would always advise people to try to sign with two companies because then your eggs aren't all in one basket. Uh, yeah. I run the Blu-rays, so does uh, Justin with Screen Team Releasing. Okay, so and then Justin got me to Amazon and Diabach and Grindhouse and and all that other stuff. So as far as Blu-rays, I really, in a way, I, I fully control that. So I control in part of the cash drawer. Now, as far as getting things to your digital platform, okay, from Netflix and everything else, you have to use a film company. And you would like to say you could put, you, you could try to get on two different platforms, uh, you know, sign, sign with two of them. And so your eggs aren't on one basket, but they don't really want to take you 
if you're trying to sign with two. And one of the reasons, there's two two reasons, and one I'm going to get back to very shortly. But if you sign with one of these companies, the scam that these people are doing is they're going to put you in a thirty thousand dollar debt. What does that debt uh, come up come with here? They're going to end up saying, "Hey, we're going to go to uh, try to get your film overseas. We're going to be flying over to the Cannes Film Festival to push your film." which is going to cost $30,000. Well, guess what, guys? They were already going to the Cannes Film Festival before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? They already have movies they're pushing. Why are your film going to cost thirty? Who needs $30,000 to go to the Cannes Film Festival? That's a no. But you're signing that up front. You're putting yourself in, uh, in debt. You're, they're also signing it with that 30 is you're going to get all the marketing done. You could, you could ask them to see what they did for marketing. They'll tell you no. You, they will not show you proof and all that. So basically, after the first quarter, they might get you where, whatever outlets, you know, HBO, whatever, you know, Voodoo, yeah. you know, all that. You can't even see your numbers. They're just going to send you a sheet back. Basically, it tells you, oh, you've only made about, you know, $8,000 this round. You still owe us, you know, $18,000. you are you are you are in the red. And you end up never yeah. seeing it. So the, it, between this and music, it's very bad. And one of the things, what, what, what's your first reaction? You and everyone listening right now, I'll get a lawyer. Guys, they'll bleed you out. They know all of us are work real world jobs. They know we're blue collar. Some of us got families. They know your, your, your pocket is, all, is, is limited. They're just going to bleed you out. They'll just be put motion in motion until you can't afford your lawyer anymore. Yeah. yeah. So that is what they do to all of us. So what happened with the distributor about nine years ago, here came these four guys and they said, well, they're going to start their own company. And here's what, what their juicer was. You pay them. You, you, you submit your film almost like you do on YouTube. They send you like a, like a dashboard and you upload your film and you put in all, yeah. the, and all the info. And you send it to them. They do a, a, you know, a quality control a check to make sure everything's in order. And then you pay them. At the time, it was $1,600 and say, get me to Netflix, get me to Vudu, get me with the Hulu, whatever, wherever you want to go, they would, they would get you there and they would pay you every quarter. Guys, this is, this is what happened for a while. It was beautiful. Everybody was getting paid. So all us filmmakers jumped there. So basically the end of last year, uh, well, sorry, the year just flipped. At the end of 2018, I didn't like all the offers I was getting for the dark military because it was everything I told you. It was like, you know, sign here, $30,000 in debt. And I'm like, guys, I'm not doing that. You know, I'm like, I got to figure out a way to get out and get on my shit myself. I'm like, so I went to the distributor and I got us on iTunes and Amazon and I <clears throat> everything past QA by January. And that you were supposed to be live within two months. It was weird. We didn't get live until June 5th of 2019. So at the time, uh, starting off, I wanted to see what my film was. So there was a rental fee for $3.99. And these guys were really good at answering me any questions. But you would write that 48 hours. So all of a sudden, I'm looking at uh, September's coming up, my first quarter. I'm going to get my payment. I'm seeing what I'm making. The day comes and you're already set up with your PayPal. The money's going to come through. Doesn't come through. I'm like, all right, give that another day or two. I wrote them. No one answers. Write them again. Nobody answers. I'm like, I just had a, I just felt the waters were wrong. I'm like, this is just weird. And then a few people, other filmmakers start talking about these guys. And it turned out, uh, Jason Rubaker, Nick, uh, Michael, and Neil, the four guys that run distributor, they closed the shop out in LA. They actually closed the shop and walked and got jobs with another business. So yeah. that's a whole class one scam right there. Okay. So we got a civil lawsuit with that. But that's not the, the worst part about all of it. What, what, what you see in the video is they're, they're, they're the, the alligator. Okay. What that is, is the third party. I don't get to talk to Amazon and iTunes. OK, because I went through them. So you got them here, iTunes and, and, and uh, Amazon. 
and these are the guys, the distributor guys, and I'm over here. I only get to talk to these guys. I can't call them. They're going to tell me to call them. So that's what that it is. It was one big cluster, and these guys have to take your film down for you. Well, mm -hmm. if you shop, guys, your film's stuck up there. It's just yeah. it, it's frozen. So that put a thousand of us in in utterable hell. So that's where uh, the protect yourself from distributor uh, group came. And a thousand of us joined, and I mean we were hounded. We were given pat fast updates and stuff. Then we got the Indie Wire. Then we got the, the L.A. Times and and Forbes magazine. I mean these guys just thought we were going to go away, and it turned out you know we've been running run, run those guys' names through the freaking mud, and that rightfully so, because yeah, exactly. you know. Uh, only one guy came forward. Uh, Neil finally talked about six weeks ago on uh, Alex Ferrari's IndieWire. And uh, he, he talked. And basically, for 90 minutes, he basically said, "Is I didn't know what was going on. Anyway, I'm over here now. Come trust me with this new company. That was the, the blunt of the whole freaking interview. It was oh, the, fuck uh, out of here. Like, uh... Yeah. And then, it, then a couple of days later, I guess he got in trouble for doing an interview and asked Alex to take it down because he signed an NDA. And I'm like, well, if you guys went under, what what do you sign? There's no NDA to, to sign. Clearly, yeah. like, clearly, he's in on it. You know, like, what do you sign an NDA for? What's wrong, that's you didn't, dude? That's you didn't know anything. You know, <laughs> so yeah, Neil. And so because they have your movie, you can't you can't go anywhere else. You're stuck yeah, in limbo. No. Like, it's that's, literally that's like ridiculous. it's literally like the the government holding your income tax check. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it, that's a, the blunt of all this. So. Basically, what I did is I crawled, what a lot of us did, we crawled, scratched, and fight. You're right in Amazon, and Amazon is the number one company in the world. Uh, they're not known just for movies. We know that. I mean, trying to get through these people, you're getting automatic, automatic replies, you know, auto intelligence and stuff. And then, like, you're, yeah. you finally get a hold of someone, you ask the question, an auto reply. But basically, for about Jesus, four months it took me to finally get my rights back when I'm sending them my website. I'm sending them every bit of info. I'm sending these people receipts. I'm sending them everything to prove. And plus, they knew. That's one thing that we had going for us. Anything came good out of this, they knew what the distributor did. So they're trying to be accommodating, but they're also the biggest company in the world. So it's not like it's a top priority. So I finally got the film back. I finally got the, the iTunes back. And I just think I was one of the more louder ones with that video and everything. I just think like once they saw you're getting loud, like you get this guy's videos down. If anyone just get his down, you know, and the other few people yeah. that are the loudest, we finally got our roots. So I got the rights to my film back. Then I have to resubmit all that Amazon stuff. And <laughs> there was a few kinks in it. And you're getting the audio replies like you must do this and that. You send it. You must do this and that. I just sent that. Please look at the date. Like <laughs> you're going on and on, guys. Please talk to someone. But I finally got it on, and then uh, you know that, uh, that's it, it was just amazing when I finally got it up. Because I mean, it was embarrassing doing all that work, and and I kept telling my my cast like, please believe in me. You know, we're gonna I'm gonna uh, get I'm gonna knock this out of the ballpark for us. I was like a guy who was just. I put so much in the marketing going into the distributor thing. I basically bought ads in magazines. I bought Facebook ads all over the world, and it all went to the distributor, and they ran off. You know, that's that. It's disgusting. That's so, rotten, man. That's so fucking rotten. God damn. And it's and there's like people in that group that paid way more than me. Like they're, like they're, they're in way worse shape. There's people that still have their film totally tied up. Like I'm trying to tell them at least what I did, but I mean, it's not working for some of the people or maybe they're not trying hard enough or maybe they are trying harder. And it's just not working. I feel so bad for these people. But so yeah. this picture about it, guys, you make a film and it's locked up in quarantine. It's just locked up and people are, what happens? Everyone asks you about your film when you're allowed, right? Hey, how's your yeah. film? Doing? Yeah. And when it when it was locked up, I was just like, yeah, we're switching distribution companies because I didn't want to say nothing because, like, I was so crushed, mm -hmm. you know? So soon as when I got the rights back, that's when I made that video. <laughs> that's when I made that video, and I, I will I will share that until I die because the yeah, fact no, that right on. Those fact that those four people are in this business, it, 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 it just grosses me out. And, I mean, I don't know how – I can't tell you offhand where these four people are working – 
I don't think Nick, I don't think he's the, he's, he's the main one. I don't think he's working anywhere because he's got so much money from us, but I, I know the other ones are working and I just don't know how you hired someone like this, yeah. you know, if, if I hired someone in my film company and I found out they had some baggage like that, I can't be associated with you. You know, yeah. you. I got to cut you. I don't, I don't want the heat, you know? Right. No, nah, that's rotten. You know, even give somebody a chance like that. You yeah. Know. So my film was shot in the fall of 2015 and mm. January 5th of this year, I felt like it finally arrived because it's now in my control. Even though it came out last year, I mean, God, mm. that's like a whole, like, ugh, you know, you're like, God, all that, like a half, you know, half a decade, basically, you know, that's crazy. That. That's crazy. Yeah, and the first quarter of the money is is I'll never say, you know. Man, man. And think about the Avengers opening weekend, Star Wars opening weekend. Like, don't yeah. even, the first week is everything. So the first quarter for an independent is everything. Because everything obviously the demand goes down. Yeah, yeah. we um, we used to do shows at this uh, theater, this local theater, and it's not it's not like a chain theater, and um, they they have to send di- like say you know the avengers come out or whatever the first two weeks of profits go right to disney they don't yep. get a cut until after that so that that's crazy that's crazy it yeah. makes sense and that's why a lot of people don't realize that movie theaters that's why that soda is six dollars that's why that's exactly because yeah they're hard i think they're getting 10 percent of the door i think is what yeah. it was yeah so it all goes to the studio yeah because i remember talking to the owner one time and when she told me that I, my jaw hung open for like a month i couldn't believe it you know yeah, so. same thing like uh, concert venues. Like I've, I worked at the Trocadero, um, I mean, up to a closed. I worked there the last 14 years, but I know 10% of that went to the house. That's it. Like 90% goes in the bands. That's just how it is. And I think at like Wells Fargo or any of the big Madison Square Garden, I think they get 20% of the tour. You know, it always goes to the band. That's why concessions are so huge. Plus those people that are paying that, that rent to, to, you know, run the concession yeah. band. Yeah. Know, so you got to kind of know how to balance that out, you know. Mm-hmm. You know. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah. It's the same type way, at, like the drive-ins, which are a lot cheaper in concessions, but that's where they make their money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the Delcy Drive-in uh, is about thirty minutes down the road from me. I always overbuy because I just love the drive-in. I just think. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, me too, man. Yeah, like I, it's just like I will overeat there because I don't want it to do good. Yeah. You know? You know, then the Mohegan's son, or I'm trying to think of the one up the Jim Thorpe where all the horror exude runs out of there. That's another one. I always like, I buy all the food. You know, it's really cheap up there, too. Like, everything's like two or three dollars. Like, Give me fifteen dollars of all this shit. <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know, that's funny. <laughs> all unhealthy, and I'm going to eat all of it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, is there anything that you uh, would like to plug or anything you got coming out? Yeah, uh, like on top uh, of all the crazy shit you got going on, like, uh, What's down the road, brother? What's 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 in the pipe, man? Uh, the pipe. Yeah. You guys, uh, most of you guys all know what Terrifier Two is. Um, we're almost done uh, filming that. My part's done with that. I know. I think they're up in somewhere in New York right now, wrapping that up. But keep an eye on that for this fall, please, guys. If you uh, uh, the subject of tonight, the dark military, um, please go to Tubi or Amazon, uh, Able TV. It's all free, guys. You don't got to do anything. Just put it on and watch. Uh, Tubi's yeah. great, man. So absolutely, absolutely. You know. Thank you. And um, <laughs> yeah, and as far as me, Lauren Leprey, hey, listen, uh, you can hit me up direct on Facebook or through Average Superstar Films, my site. I'm always looking for film work. And uh, yeah, just, hey, I just passed along my art, and I thank you guys so much for having me on.